Hello guys, Winston here. I will admit that I have something of an unhealthy obsession with graphite. Even before I set out to test micro-machining in it, and before I machined an ingot mold for silver in it, graphite was on my radar as just a cool material that could effortlessly hold an insane level of detail. Sort of like Ren Shape, but cooler, more exotic, and more dangerous. My fascination was spawned from these posts by Kern Precision from long ago. They machined a pretty dope Sears tower out of a bar of graphite, and since then I've been looking for an excuse to machine an entirely cosmetic piece out of graphite just for fun. With episode 9 hitting theaters this week, I figured that something Star Wars would be appropriate. Maybe a helmet, but I would have to narrow down my choices. The obvious ones like Darth Vader's or Kylo Ren's are iconic, but terrible to machine due to their abundance of hard angular corners and overhanging geometry. The Mandalorian helmet has been done to death lately, Plus, lots of models I found lacked a visor, and I needed this geometry to be entirely closed. So that left me with, basically, stormtroopers. And historically, there have been a ton of different variations of costumes, but being that this is 2019, first order all the way. I found a reasonable model online with proportions I thought looked pretty good, and I pulled it into Fusion 360. If you're subscribed to the Carbide 3D channel, you'll have seen this setup before. It's the same one I used to make an aluminum Maltese Falcon statue and Buddha Yoda. I'm using the symmetry of my stock to rotate my part like a poor man's fourth axis. But for those of you who've inexplicably not seen that video yet, here is the rundown of what I'm doing. When you have an STL or mesh, the best you can do to machine it is to dump 3D toolpaths over the geometry and hope for the best. My strategy of choice here is usually a one-two punch of adaptive roughing plus parallel finishing. Now, at Fusion Academy earlier this year, I was inspired by a morsel of cam knowledge shared by Rob Lockwood. Use templates. Not like the built-in templates in Fusion, but templating as in set up your setups and toolpaths to be as easy to copy and paste as possible. Let me demonstrate. Here I have a setup that will hit my helmet from the front. I have an adaptive roughing operation and some parallel toolpaths that will refine the shape. These are contained by a sketch that's offset 45 degrees from both X and Y, so no matter which side you look at the helmet from, the projection of that sketch onto the plane you're looking at is the same. If I duplicate this whole setup and change the orientation, the model is still the same, the containment sketch is still valid, those two things are basically all 3D toolpaths care about, so I can just regenerate my toolpaths in this setup and boom. Toolpaths for a second side are done. Duplicate it two more times, change the orientations, and we have toolpaths that will hit my stock from every side. If I want to machine a different model, all I need to do is drag and drop that model into my setup, and the 3D toolpaths will automatically target that new geometry. Minimal change, maximum effect. This is how you make cam work for you. Alright, pep talk is done, so let's go to the Nomad. I don't have square graphite bar stock, so let's fix that. I'll gently clamp a block of graphite to my Nomad with a piece of paper as a shim underneath it so I don't gouge my aluminum table. I'll face the top, sides, and front in this first setup. That will get me five sides that are flat and square, assuming the face on the bottom is also flat, which I have no problem accepting. I'll gently swap around my clamps and machine away the back side separating this bar from the parent stock. I can tweak my toolpaths by a thou or two in order to get my stock to exactly one inch square within an acceptable margin of error. Now throwing this stock into a Carbide 3D low profile vise that I've indicated in so its back draw is parallel to the Y axis. I'll find the x-axis center of my setup by touching off on both sides of the graphite bar and averaging the result. I'll find the z-axis center by touching off on the bottom of my vise and setting my origin half an inch above the floor. And then for the y-axis zero, I'll sort of just eyeball that. Alright, now we can get to the fun machining. Graphite cuts ridiculously easily, almost as easily as Ren Shape, but you do need to ensure that you're not letting airborne particulates float away. Bigger chunks have enough momentum to get away, but also enough mass to settle on their own. The little stuff needs to be captured by a vacuum with HEPA filtering. Failure to do so may result in you frying your CNC or you with some nasty respiratory issues. I'm electing to rough all four sides first with the 102 8 inch end mill instead of roughing and finishing each side first before moving on to the next. That's mainly because I hate tool changes and rotating a bar and sliding it against a hard stop is way faster than undoing an ER collet. For finishing, I'm using a tool out of the Bits and Bits catalog, this 132nd inch deep flute ball and mill. 
it's got enough reach to roll over the edges of my model without crashing the shoulder into my part. 10,000 RPM, 40 inches per minute, and a 2,000 step over. I could probably program it to go faster, but without faster machine accelerations to match an increased look ahead on the controller, there's really not much point. It's just going to end up stuttering along. I ran through the rest of my finishing toolpaths and ended up with a pretty well-defined model. Good enough that the limiting factor was clearly the resolution of the STL that I'd started from. I probably could have seen this coming if I had looked closer at the model, but I wasn't paying enough attention and I let the blending mode of the poly shader lull me into complacency. Next time, I'll have to find something with at least triple the poly count. Now, my plan is to display this on a pedestal and never touch the graphite by hand because it picks up finger oils and discolors way too easily. So I'll need to keep my helmet on this cylindrical stump and part it off from the rest of my stock. I programmed a simple toolpath that would cut the same line down to the middle of my stock, and I ran this twice, rotating my stock between the runs. I want the breakpoint to be at the midplane so that the fracture doesn't propagate and cause a chunk of graphite to break off the cylindrical wall. For my pedestal, I drew up a quick little hexagon and added on the logo of the first order, which is conveniently a circle in a hexagon. This made aligning things super convenient. Adaptive roughing to bring my excessively thick stock down to 0.3 inches. Finish the inner bore. Face the top. Profile around the outside with a roughing pass enabled, so I'm finishing the walls at each step down. Engrave the first order logo and use the same 501 PCB engraver to also lightly bevel the inner hole. Use a ball and mill to scallop the outer chamfer because I was too lazy to dig up my real chamfering tool. And then tweak the inner bore and creep up on a snug fit for the helmet stump. And finally, in the words of Bobby Duke, it's finished. Aside from the tedious stock preparation, I really enjoyed this project because it had no practical purpose except to scratch an itch I had to make a highly detailed cosmetic part. The graphite ended up doing exactly what I wanted it to, and even though I think I could make something nicer looking if I had a higher resolution model, the technical aspect of the machining was flawless. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back soon with more CNC projects and DIY nonsense.